Here we go. <laughs> And welcome to another episode of the Jinto Cast. Unfortunately, our regular host, the indomitable Ken Owen, is out, and I will be filling in for him. My name is Michael Haddam, and I am a PhD candidate and teaching fellow at Yale University. I'm joined today, as always, by Roy Rogers, who is a PhD candidate in the History Department at the CUNY Graduate Center and a writing fellow at the New York City College of Technology. Hello, Roy. Howdy, Michael. And we are also joined by one of our uh, regular guest panelists, Mark Boonshoff, who is a Ph.D. candidate at Ohio State University. Hey, Mark. Hi, Michael. So just a brief note before we begin. So next week, in honor of Pope's Day, uh, the Jinto will be running a week-long roundtable on the legacy of Al Young. And to tie in with that roundtable, it was our intention to have this month's episode focus on popular protests in early America, topic... Uh, on which uh, the work of our very own Ken Owen focuses. And while the blog will still be doing the roundtable next week, since Ken is out at the moment, uh, we've decided to postpone talking about popular protests until next month when our fearless host has returned. So with that out of the way, let's move on to our new topic for this episode, which is education in early America. And I thought we might begin by trying to draw a brief picture of the educational landscape in the colonial period. So, um, Mark, can you sort of give us a sense, you, you work on education specifically, and can you sort of give us a sense of, of what this educational landscape uh, looked like in, in, say, you know, the, the early 18th century? Yeah, there are um, basically town schools in New England, which are kind of public schools that teach basic skills, but that's unique to, to New England. Most of the rest of uh, the 13 colonies, education basically happens in the home um, and in the church. By 1701, there are only three colleges, um, Harvard, Yale, and William and & Mary, and for the, those mostly train elites, um, most of whom will go on to become ministers, and then there are the few elites who also send their kids um, overseas for uh, to go to colleges in, in England. But, I mean, that's pretty much the lay of the land. There's not all that much going on sort of turn of the 18th century. So, uh, I mean, give us a sense of, of who went to school. You mentioned elites. I mean, who went to school? Uh, I mean, what, what ages did they go to school? Did they go to college, per se? Sure. So in these New England town schools, it would tend to be really pretty young kids, four to five, and they'd go um, – to learn to read, and then they'd learn to write around seven or eight, and then when they got the hang of that, most of them were done. Um, so the, for the elites that would go on to college there and elsewhere, it was kind of whenever you were ready to go is when you would go. So you'd have a, you had a really wide range of ages at colleges. You could have, you know, 12, 13-year-olds, and you could also have people in their early 20s, than sort of what we associate as college age. So it was, it's a, it's a really, it was much more fluid back then. So, I mean, you say, you know, when you're re- what determines when when a child was ready to go to college? Basically, the first things they have to nail down are you know, grammar and penmanship and writing English language. Um, and then they would move on to more advanced things, um, logic, rhetoric, um, math. Uh, but basically, the big kind of prerequisite for college is having a pretty good handle on Greek and Latin. And so most of the colleges had some sort of entrance requirements that were based on your ability to, to do all the, the earlier subjects, but also that you had some working knowledge of, of classical languages. So in addition to, to the, the language study, once they're there, uh, you know, can you give us a sense of, of what they're studying sort of subject-wise? Yeah. Um, so one of the things, they're going to they're gonna continue to study a lot of Latin and Greek, but they're gonna, the emphasis is going to turn from uh, not solely reading it and learning how to, you know, grammar, but also to kind of learn how to write, um, learn how to do Latin oratory. Um, I mean, that's a big thing at college graduation ceremonies would be the sort of best students would, would get up and do a piece from Cicero or something like that. Um, but they're also learning um, the big kind of capstone. I think the most important thing uh, is moral philosophy, which is base, basically um, ethics. Um, and, and in this period, what it really has to do with is kind of making sense of religion and um and the Enlightenment and sort of figuring out how you can be a, a person who is both 
a good Christian and also a man of the Enlightenment. Because, I mean, that is effectively what they are creating. These schools are pious, enlightened men. Right, and that's a, that's actually a, a very sort of recent development in terms of the early 18th century, right? This is a struggle that went on in both Harvard and then uh, later at Yale, right, where the curriculum took a turn from the initial sort of, you know, strictly seminary sort of curriculum uh, towards what, what they would have called the, the new learning. Perhaps, maybe you could just say something else about the purpose of the education. You said it's primarily to to train ministers? Yeah. So the colleges, I mean, uh, not especially, but uh, exclusively, are, are the places training ministers. That there is this sense um, in the 17th and the early 18th century that ministers need to have um, a college education in order to be to to be capable and so to get ordinate ordained you need to to go through this but also the schools schooling in general just has a kind of a, a religious framework to it so the town schools in new england that are that are teaching four or five year olds to maybe 10 year olds that might seem like it's just practical um they're learning basic literacy basic numeracy but the the goal at least as the puritan sort of uh, elites put it is to is the, the goals are religious um, I'm going to read from one of the, the school laws but they they sort of they write and this is in the preface of one of the laws it being one chief project of that old deluder Satan to keep men from knowledge of the scriptures so basically one of the things that Satan will do will be to, to delude you but the, the best sort of way to head that off is to be able to read the scriptures yourself and so this literacy is really important for Puritans at least to, to sort of stave off the devil. And so even when you're talking about basic education for a four- and five-year-old, it's all about building a kind of religious community. So, Mark, you, you point out that these are primarily religious institutions, right, created to, to train clergy, and, and really there's only a few of them. There's only three from 1701 when Yale is founded uh, well into the 1740s. But in the, the sort of mid-1740s, the educational landscape in the colonies begins to change. And I, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about what was happening and, and, and why that was happening. Roy. Well, to really understand what ends up happening in the 1740s, we need to go back to the second college that was founded during the colonial period at the end of the 18th century, or excuse me, the end of the 17th century, which was William & Mary. Because William & Mary is very interesting because it has a lot in common with Harvard, but it also has a lot in common with later institutions like Yale and particularly Princeton, because William & Mary is founded to bring order to a very chaotic establishment in Virginia, both a political and a religious establishment that had been all kinds of disrupted throughout the 17th century. And after the Glorious Revolution, there was a we, James Blair was sent to Virginia to help make sense of this. And one of the things that William and Mary did was establish a college. And like Harvard, it was supposed to tr train clergymen. But this, in this example, uh, it's Anglican clergy versus congregational clergy. But there's also a broader curriculum that's established in Virginia that is meant to train not just clergymen, but train Virginia gentlemen who will function as vestrymen in the establishment. So you'll not only be creating a cohort of home-trained Anglican ministers that could help bring order to Virginia, but you'll also be training vestrymen who will also be working alongside these clergymen in a politically and religiously orthodox way. So in many ways, William and Mary prefigures the more professionally oriented colleges that will begin to emerge in the lit, in the early 18th century, I think uh, Roy makes a really good point here, um, especially about sort of disorder leading to, um, edu to educational institution building. And I think this is basically the narrative we have for the mid 18th century in the middle colonies, which is um, effectively there's a massive population boom uh, starting in the in the early 18th century and gets kind of out of hand by the 1730s, and effectively there are religious people and not enough ministers. Um, and so in the Mid-Atlantic, uh, we've talked about this on a previous episode on the Great Awakening, but basically religious revivals ha start to happen in force and largely because people are trying to find uh, another way um, to kind of to practice religion when they don't have um, a stable clergy. And what this ends up leading to is um, people with different theological opinions building – 
schools in order to train ministers that can then um, bring some order out of out of this disorder. Um, but like Roy says, while they're initially um, the initial urge is really born of of disorder and and especially in the Mid Atlantic religious disorder, these schools end up taking on um, much broader importance in, in terms of ordering society writ large. Right, and there's also this paradox where you have this boom in college building that comes out of the denominational competition exacerbated by the Great Awakening, and yet one of the most important developments of the college building is not about the creation of new clergy so much as the creation of a new professional class, right? A lot of these young men uh, coming out of the newer colleges like the College of New Jersey, uh, King's College, and some of the others, also uh, the, the older three, they're not necessarily going to become clergymen. A lot of them are going to graduate and go on to law apprenticeships. They'll become uh, merchants or doctors or, or uh, government officials. There's a new professional class that comes out of this college boom in the 1740s and 1750s. And it's a process that had already begun earlier in the century, but it really gets accelerated by the opportunities afforded by the, this new host of colleges and, and the increased access to what you know, we today would call higher education. That's absolutely true. And I think what's important about colleges and the broader sort of transformation of the colonial society in the mid-century to the revolution is the broadening of the political and religious establishment. And if you like, let's go to go back to my William and Mary example. If you look at the people who are educated in that sort of second generation of mid-century people, very few of them become Anglican ministers or even Presbyterian or Baptist ministers. Most, many of them become doctors, lawyers, and leaders of and political and statesmen. And there's this weird while these colleges are not weird, but this really interesting transformation that while these colleges continue to hammer home that they are religiously oriented institutions, the families that are paying for these educations are increasingly expecting their sons not to leave as ministers, but to leave as gentlemen. And it's sort of showing where the political power in these societies is shifting beginning in the mid-century. Roy, I think this is a really good point, and I think it's also uh, it's worth mentioning that it's not just happening in colleges, and I think that's sort of one of the interesting things about the Awakening in particular is that it creates also what are called academies, which are basically feeder schools for colleges and also um, – or schools that students will use to get a, a, a relatively advanced education but not necessarily spend as much time – um, composing Latin or orations as they would in college, and so it's a little bit more um, practical, maybe. But these kind of schools are often run by individual ministers, and they pop up um, all over the place in in small towns throughout the Mid Atlantic, um, New Jersey, um, and you even get these kind of going into like even back country Virginia. Um, a lot of the ministers who end up running colleges, people like Samuel Davies, run these out of their house in. Um, in when when they're running church uh, where, where their ministry is, but I mean these schools like the colleges build a kind of culture of sort of debate and and kind of engagement with the public sphere basically. Um, and so, at, at for instance at at the College of New Jersey you see um, debating societies. There's the Whig and Cleosophic Society that that are the sort of big deals, and that and that a lot of the political education almost happens in these um, extracurricular uh, moments, and that. I think is true of academies too, and so you'll in in really out of the way places you'll have all of a sudden ten or fifteen um, teenage men, boys really, um, who are looking to get an advanced education for a variety of reasons and are thinking deeply about um, what that what their place in the world is and what the world uh, sort of and what that means politically and and socially. Right, and I, and I think there's also another dynamic that we need to talk about, which is that because these colleges had largely trained clergy for a long time, often the most educated class of people in a given town or city were the clergymen, right? And this gave them their own form of cultural authority to go along with whatever religious and or political authority they may have had. For example, if they had close relationships with uh court politicians. But but around mid-century, you start to see that dynamic shifting. Before mid-century, you didn't have to go to college to be a lawyer. 
you just had to complete a law apprenticeship. But this new generation of lawyers would be college educated and then do an apprenticeship. So you end up with a situation where the cultural authority that the clergy had enjoyed thanks to their education was now being challenged by these young professionals. And I think that one of the places you see this play out uh, in the 1750s is in New York City over the founding of King's College. There you have an Anglican clergy that is intimately tied to the colony's most powerful political faction, most of whom are Anglicans. And so, you know, wanting to advance in New York government or society required conforming to that Anglicanized culture. Right. So you would see ambitious young members of the Dutch Reformed Church, you know, convert at least outwardly to Anglicanism. And the the clergy's plans for a proposed college in New York were to, were to create an Anglican seminary that could compete with the Congregational Colleges uh, to the North and the Presbyterian College of New Jersey. But they they ended up being challenged by a group of young college educated lawyers who wanted that new college uh, in the city to effectively be non denominational and actually rather secular in a number of respects. Uh, but this caused a very public conflict. Uh, between these two groups over the course of a number of years. And it's just one specific example of how this new professional class would begin to, to change the landscape of not only uh, colonial politics, but colonial culture more generally. That's very, very true, Michael, because I think something that unites the four major Anglican establishments, uh, New York, Maryland, Virginia, and South Carolina in this period, is because of the awakening one of the chronic problems of the Anglican establishments, the shortage of ministers, is really, really pointed out. And there's this just drive to try to educate more and more and ordain more and more young Anglican men. But sending them to England for this education is just unaffordable. And these missionaries from England are proven to be unreliable. So there's a huge crisis within the Anglican establishments of how are we going to meet this challenge? And the only way we're going to meet it is to expand our educational options. But that proves to be just as tricky as importing ministers had been in previous generations. Right. And I mean, you know, there, you know, it's a very anxious moment for the Anglicans in, in the early 1750s, right, because of, uh, you know, the the, the sort of uh, the, the fallout from the from the Great Awakening has really uh, energized um, non dissenters, really non Anglicans. And the big problem that that the Anglican Church has, which the Congregational Church doesn't have, uh, and which other dissenting groups didn't have, was that uh, to be ordained an Anglican uh, clergyman, you had to go to England. You could only be ordained in England, right? You you could uh, you could go to college here in the United, in the colonies, but in order to actually get ordained, you had to make the trip to England. And as you said, you know that's very expensive, and um, that that proved to be a big problem for them. And it's why uh, through the 1750s and in the 1760s. Uh, that, that's really the one of the driving forces behind, you know, Anglican uh, calls for for an American bishop is because if you have a bishop in the colonies, then you know, uh, clergymen could be ordained here. One of the interesting continuities between the mid-century and the end of century questions of education is that elites agreed that there needed to be more education for a variety of purposes to make order out of chaos in many ways the to reform for the british empire and elites in places like williamsburg in places like new york in places like boston to make order out of this increasingly chaotic society and you see the same tensions in the 1780s and 1790s in this post revolutionary society where clearly education and reforming it is going to hopefully solve these problems. But the problem is when these educational opportunities are expanded, the results of this are not at all what the elite, the elites intended. Yeah, Michael and, and Roy both, I think you both make really good points here. And I think that what effectively is becoming clear by say the 1760s, or at least progressively is becoming more clear throughout the 18th century is that knowledge and education was inherently political and that um, debates about education um, and and building schools really drove at questions about the basis of sort of what kind of state should there be, what what should be the basis of political order. Um, 
And I think these have really important ramifications um, into the revolution and well beyond. Yeah, I think there's very much a debate going on beginning in the early 1750s through to the imperial crisis about, you know, what is the relationship between the church and the state, between the state and educational institutions. And I think the relationship between both the church and state and civil society more broadly. And one of the things both of you have really helped draw out here is the way in which education went from being primarily religious in its character and intent to becoming highly politicized after mid-century. And, you know, we see that reflected in the founding of King's College that I talked about and uh, just more generally in, in the curriculum becoming more secularized or enlightened, certainly more public-minded. And I think it did have a very significant impact because a lot of these young men graduating in the 1740s and 1750s from colleges and academies of the kind Mark talked about are going to be in potential positions of leadership uh, when the imperial crisis begins in the mid-1760s. And their experiences, not only with education, but the politics of education and the communities created in those schools are going to shape their reactions and responses to the events that eventually lead to independence. And so that uh, effectively brings us up to uh, the revolution and uh, college building has, I mean, effectively slowed down, if not ceased. There's a revolution and a war going on. But I wonder if we can maybe still try to get a sense of what's happening on the educational landscape uh, during the, the American Revolution. Well, I think one of the main things that happens is actually that the schools close because a lot of the students get into the fight. Um, and um, especially in the Mid-Atlantic, uh, where Presbyterians are almost uniformly um, pro-independence, they tend to be in either the state militias or the Continental Army. But, I mean, they, some of these schools basically close down and just sort of reform as units, almost, military units. Um, and so, I mean, that it's clearly a disruption of, of educational sort of – of education at all because, I mean, the teachers are leaving with the students. But the other thing that I find really interesting is that – and I don't know if this is exactly the British recognizing that this was happening or if it's just that in a lot of towns, um, academies were kind of the biggest brick building and so um, they tended to end up housing either hospitals or barracks or um, – or things like that, but a lot of academies get get bombarded during the war. Um, and I think the most fa- famous example is actually is all and colleges too. And I think the most famous example is uh, is Princeton College of New Jersey. Then, but it, you can still see the cannonball mark outside of on the side of Nassau Hall if you are on the Princeton campus. Um, and I, I mean, I think that's so. It's it's not just the war is destabilizing and education is one of those things that gets disrupted. It's also that education and educational institutions, the, the real physical stuff are kind of the, the, the products, the people and the buildings are just caught up in this. Do we see a similar dynamic happening in Virginia? No, oh, we certainly do. Like famously, um, Reverend James Madison, who is um, James Madison, the president, James Madison's uh, less famous older cousin, organized a militia company of the undergrads. He basically seized control of the college from its Virginia, or excuse me, from its um, pro-British leadership during the war. And then, and to hammer home what Mark said, it's, the war, not only is there a conscious effort sometimes by the British to attack educational systems, but there's also happenstance, like to go back to William and Mary, which had a very pleasant relationship with its uh, French occupiers during the war. The French, though, accidentally burned down part of the campus during their stay, destroying Madison's library and a whole – just the war itself on all levels, both consciously and unconsciously, just simply – in, in some ways created something like a fresh slate in many of these colleges that would create an open question of what to do with them after the revolution. Right. I think you see a similar dynamic in uh, New York, right? Alexander Hamilton is a student at King's College, and he very much gets caught up in the imperial crisis and the patriot resistance movement in, in the mid-1770s. He's out on the street giving speeches and writing pamphlets, and it goes back to what both of you said about the students and the institutions being consumed by the revolution itself. 
So it seems that education, much like the rest of colonial society, finds itself in a sort of state of suspended animation during the war. But when the dust of the war clears, education doesn't necessarily look the same as it did in the 1740s and 1750s. It, it changes in a number of very important ways, and I think that one of the big themes uh, we think about in this post-war period is the role of education in, in citizenship in the new republic. That is the, you know, the, the notion that being a virtuous republican citizen requires a certain degree of civic education. And I mean, we've talked about that a bit, uh, how it has its origins in the late colonial period, um, as do many early republic political developments, but that's a rant for another day. Uh, I was kind of hoping we could talk a little bit more about the growing relationship between education and citizenship in the early republic. Mark. Well, Michael, I think there's a the certain rhetoric that leads that way. And, and I think in certain instances, you actually do see um, education kind of reshaped to fit the needs of a republic, the unique needs of a republic. And I think nothing, nowhere is this more true than the rise of female academies, which I think we'll get to in a little more detail in a minute. But I also think that some of this rhetoric is kind of overblown. Um, you, you end up seeing throughout the 1780s really elaborate plans for usually some combination of like a national university and then state um, or town or county level um, school system, real public school system. So you would end up having having these higher level institutions that would train a good Republican elite, and then you would have kind of lower level schools that would train an entire virtuous citizenry. But almost none of these plans get adopted. I mean, and and in some cases, it's a real noticeable failure that they don't. I mean, they're in certain certain state constitutions, I think um, North Carolina and Pennsylvania both have provisions that you need to have a state school system or county level schools, and they it just doesn't happen. And so, I think there is this impetus, but then it gets rolled back because of really um, the politics of the 1780s and the 1790s, which are, as we know, not really as um, consensual as sometimes we like to think they are. That there really are debates about what government can and cannot do or should and should not do and at what levels of government certain things should happen. And this, these debates end up stifling um, education reform. And I think this, I mean, you know, things are changing, but this is also the problem of the 1750s and 1760s rearing its head. People are, people know that education and politics are intimately intertwined and so the stakes are really high. And so I think you don't necessarily see the fruits of the ideas that flower. Oh, that's certainly true. I mean, look at Jefferson's famous proposals for Virginia, right? From To rebuild Virginia's education system, that's probably in some ways better than Virginia's current <laughs> public school system. Uh, and it goes nowhere in Richmond. Then there's the attempt to found the University of Virginia, which does succeed eventually, but ends up making its biggest advocates upset with the amount of horse trading that they had to do and the compromises that they had to make. And then it would always, to this day, has an awkward relationship with the assembly in Richmond. And then and William & Mary as well in Virginia. William & Mary is a technically a private institution after the revolution, but it's a semi-public one as well. And it doesn't fully become a public school until the 20th century. It's a strange, strange period where there's a lot of talk, as Mark makes clear, about a fundamental reform, but it doesn't go anywhere because of the, this political nature of knowledge. And there's a concern on both levels, I think, of the political system where elites are trying – the elites who survived the revolution are trying to desperately hold on to their power. And then you have rising classes of new elites who see, sense opportunities in this post-revolutionary period who want to use education to uh, further their ambitions for themselves or for their children. And there's this collision of these two different interests that sort of creates – a mire of half-implemented reforms. Now, having said that, right, I, I mean, I think that, you know, we do see, I think, a, a significant change in uh, the role of education uh, for women in, in the early republic, right? And I think that that's, that's very much a, 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 a significant development. And I wonder if we could maybe talk a little bit more about that. I think it's, it's clear, Michael, that... Um, Education does change dramatically for women, and it's one of the 
the ways in which the revolution changes women's lives. Female academies, which are basically um, privately funded uh, schools for, for women, really expand to a surprising degree. It's not just in cities where we would expect them to, to pop up. I mean, in the colonial period, there are um, sort of private uh, schools teaching girls in New York and Philadelphia, but it's not just in the cities. They, they kind of, they pop up um, throughout the, 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 the United States in rural areas that are kind of not off the beaten path, sort of rural areas that are, you know, along stagecoach lines and things like this. And so it's not just elite women that get to go to these schools, but um, if, you, if you happen to live close enough to one of these places, it's also a kind of middling, upper middling um, set of women that can go to these schools, and and they're going to learn um, not just kind of things that we would that they would then associate with females uniquely, like what they would call ornamental skills, like needlepoint or something like that. They're actually learning substantive stuff by the 1810s, 1820s, the curriculum is basically what it is at colleges for men with the exception of um, women don't learn classics to the same degree that men do. What's interesting about these female academies is that they really embody the possibilities and the pitfalls of these of educational reform that we've been talking about this entire episode. Because on one hand, these new academies uh, embody what's traditionally called Republican womanhood or Republican motherhood, where the reason for these women to go to these academies is to receive an education so that they can go home and, on one hand, aid their husbands in making good Republican decisions and being the best public men that they can be, and on the other hand, to educate their sons and their daughters to make them good Republican citizens or Republican wives and sort of prep their children to go off either to a male academy and then college or a female academy and then marriage for the, for daughters. That has a couple of possibilities within it. One, it sort of conflates what historians call the public and private roles for women, where on one hand, women are leaving the home to gain this education to go off and into this largely homosocial situation of with these other girls and young women and are receiving this education, which is in many ways a very public thing. On the other hand, it's a privately oriented public action, where at the end of the day it's meant to reinscribe this very sharp gender norm where women are to be primarily focused at the home. Additionally, we run into the tension of whether or not for most women this was in many ways not something new. In many ways, it's sort of an expanded, maybe republicanized version, particularly for elite women, of older forms of education, where in many ways it's just a finishing school meant to make them more competitive in a new republican marriage market. And so when we look at women's education, we traditionally see it maybe as the way of producing the the Judith Sargent Murrays of the world, but it's also in many ways conservative at the same time. So it, women's education really does embody many of the themes that we've been talking about. Right. I think you make that point really well, right? You, you sort of get at how, you know, what might seem like a progressive policy on its surface was actually girded with a, a very uh, genuine conservatism and that this very much affected the policy's outcomes. Right. And in some ways, it's representative of a broader tension within society and politics in the early republic that would only uh, grow further into the 19th century. But it wasn't just women in the early part of the century who, who gained new access to education and educational institutions. Young white men of middling status are also gaining increased access uh, to all levels of education. But it actually goes well beyond that, doesn't it? It does, because we increasingly see, uh, particularly in the middle, the mid-Atlantic, uh, expanding educational opportunities for African Americans, uh, which goes hand-in-hand hand with reform of slavery in the North, where you have a generation of reformers, both black and white, who work to begin to gradually emancipate the slave population of the North, particularly in Pennsylvania and New York, and they also see education as the key element for making that transition from slavery to freedom possible. But like with the story of women's education in the early republic, the story of 
African American education is also equally contradictory. I mean, where do these where do these uh, African free schools uh, come from? What wh- who who's founding an African free school, for example? The most famous one, Michael, is the New York African Free School, which is founded in New York um, by the New York Manumission Society. So, it, as Roy was kind of getting at, it's very bound up. African American education in the early republic is very bound bound up in sort of northern anti-slavery uh, effectively and um and I think the New York African Free School especially is the ambitions are to use the schools kind of a, a uh to demonstrate the possibility of of African American citizenship and the but even as they're doing that um the rules are different. The public perception of the schools are different. Um, what they're learning um, is going to be based on a different sort of benchmark for, for the, than co- when compared with, with the white male academy. And so while there's a, these schools are holding up the possibility of citizenship, they are also reinforcing um, difference at the same time. And I think you know this is, again, a, a lot of the themes we're working with, this is sort of similar to, to um, what's happening with women where they're – getting a kind of equal education, but it's reinforcing inequality. Right, Mark. The thing is about these schools, and I think what makes them an interesting topic for further investigation, is they're being reassessed, right? The traditional interpretation of the African Free School and other similar schools is is what you said, that they were very circumscribed, that it was offering sort of this carrot of full equal citizenship, that African Americans would never have been able to achieve, uh, and in many ways that never able to achieve it was part of the purpose. It was a form uh, of social control, you could say, uh, to make them, quote, somewhat more independent, right? But there's a reassessment of these schools that have gone on in sort of recent works by people like Paul Pogar that talk about these educational projects as a serious black and white initiative together to try to create a black citizenship in freedom that was circumscribed by logistical problems, by a racist culture that wasn't necessarily willing to accept this possibility of black citizenship, but that the educational projects themselves were serious, legitimate attempts to create African-American citizens. And I think It remains an open question whether this is true or not, and I think it's going to be really interesting to see where the latest scholarship pushes these questions. So there seems to be a debate about the intent of the founding of these schools in the short term, but I think I'm right in saying that there there is a general consensus that these schools for both African Americans and women did nevertheless lay a foundation for the abolition and women's movements as you get further into the 19th century. So we've talked about education in the colonial period uh, during the revolution and the changes that it underwent uh, in the early republic. And I thought that to wrap up the conversation today, we can maybe talk a little bit about the place of the history of education in our own teaching uh, on early America. Well, for me, it definitely comes up most when I'm talking about disenfranchised groups and their access to education. I mean, that's where the history of education most comes into my survey. So we talk about the things that we've talked about in the last, uh, say, 15 minutes or so of this episode, the history of the education of women, the history of the education of African Americans, of Native Americans, and later in the 19th century, the tensions between expanding education to the working classes and or it remaining largely accessible to elites. I mean, for myself, I think that when you're talking about early America, one of the things students seem interested in is when you're talking about the colleges, not so much education generally, but I think that there's something relatable there for them to grab onto. And I mean, I talk to a lot of other people teaching early American history who tell me that students often come up with paper topics related to the colleges because it's relatable to them. And I think, you know, it's a way for them to put themselves into the historical circumstances. And that's not something, you know, they can always do very easily in a course on early America. So I think that in talking about early America, the colleges themselves really do offer uh, students a way to see themselves reflected in the content of the course. 
I think that's a really good point, Michael. I think um, that sometimes the 18th century can seem, the 18th and 19th century can seem really just confusing, I mean, and hard to get your head around. Republican ideas and sort of the political debates. But, but the debates over education are just really kind of the same in a lot of ways. And so questions are, who gets educated and why? Whether or not education fosters social equality, political equality, or not. And at the institutional level, who pays for education and what role does the state have in in funding education and, and, and directing education? And I think those questions have been running through our conversation here, and they're still the, the questions that um, policy people are debating at the moment. That's a fantastic point about relevance, Mark, and I think it brings us to a good closing point for this episode. I'd like to thank our two panelists, Roy Rogers. Thank you, Roy. You're welcome, Michael. And Mark Boonshoff. Thank you, Mark. Always a pleasure, Michael. If you like what you've heard and want to hear more, you can subscribe to the GentoCast and download any of our 12 back episodes in the iTunes Store. You can find us on Twitter at, at GentoCast and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash the GentoCast. You can also find more information about the GentoCast as well as further reading lists for uh, each episode in their individual posts at the Gento blog itself at earlyamericanist.com. The Gento Cast is part of the Gento Podcast Network, which also includes the History Carousel, bringing the past full circle with the present. And if you enjoy the Gento Cast, you'll also probably enjoy a new non-Gento interview-based podcast on early American history, which we're happy to promote called Ben Franklin's World. It's hosted by Liz Kovar and can be found at benfranklinsworld.com. Thanks again for listening to the Gentocast, and we hope you'll join us for the next episode. Mm-hmm.